Okay, all you cool cats and kittens, let's learn some science. What do you say? All right, our topic this week is redox chemistry. I told you today we were going to talk a bit about the activity series, and we're also going to talk about another aspect of redox reactions that I haven't really told you about just yet. So, the activity that you did online, the online simulation, should have given you, by the end, something pretty close to this activity series here on the left. Um, now, the activity series that I have listed here does not include every substance, obviously, and you can find longer lists, um, but this is a sample list, and I'm listing them from most active to least active. The elements that are the most active are usually found as their ions. And the elements that are the least active are usually found in their elemental form, as solids. So if we think about a sample problem from your simulation yesterday, you took a piece of magnesium and added it to a solution of, let's say, copper nitrate. But we know copper nitrate, CuNO32, does not exist in solution. What exists instead? It's an ionic compound. Will this ionic compound dissolve? Yep, it'll dissolve because it has nitrate. And if it dissolves, what else will it do? It's going to dissociate. So this compound dissolves and dissociates. To dissociate is to break apart into its ions. So this copper nitrate solution is going to have copper 2 plus ions, and nitrate ions. And just like we saw with solutions before, um, before we embarked upon this online learning adventure, we're going to have two nitrate ions for every single copper ion that we have there in solution. All right, so Magnesium is an active metal. It's the top of our activity series. Copper is an inactive metal. It's down there at the bottom. So most of the time we would expect to find magnesium as an ion. Most of the time we would expect to find copper in its metallic form, in its elemental form. So these are wrong, to, for, for lack of a better word. When I put the magnesium into solution, they're going to fix themselves. What's going to happen, and when you watch the... Um, the molecular scale videos in the simulation yesterday, you should have seen that a copper ion will float up to this piece of magnesium and electrons get transferred. Electrons are going to go from a magnesium atom to a copper atom. One magnesium atom is going to lose two electrons. It's going to give those two electrons to a copper atom. As a result, a copper atom is going to stick to the piece of magnesium and a magnesium ion is going to float away into solution. A copper ion is going to stick to the magnesium, and a magnesium ion floats away in solution. Now, I'm not drawing the nitrate ions here in this solution because it just gets too busy and hard to understand. And the nitrate ions are going to be what kind of ion? If we were to write the complete ionic equation and the net ionic equation, you know what? Actually, let's make that one of the questions for today. What kind of ions are the nitrate ions in this reaction? It's a piece of why I don't feel like I need to write them over here. So let's go ahead and put a few more on here. Let's stick a couple more of these copper atoms to our magnesium. And for each copper atom I stick onto the magnesium, I'm going to have to have a magnesium ion in solution. So when I pull this piece of magnesium out, what I saw was that now the piece of magnesium had a copper layer around the outside. Now, one thing you might not have noticed in the simulation, it's there, but it's kind of subtle. What, do you happen to remember what color the solution was for copper ions? We've actually worked with several copper ion solutions in this class in different labs, and most of the time they're blue or green. 
Well, you may not know this, but magnesium ions in solution do not have a color. So if you go back and look at the simulation again, after the magnesium metal has been in the solution for a little while and it's pulled out with that metallic copper on it, this solution was substantially less blue because the ions that made it blue were the copper ions and they're gone now. We'll go ahead and draw some magnesium ions here just, to, just for the sake of completeness. Now if I tried to reverse this, if I had a piece of copper and I put it into a solution of magnesium nitrate, I would get no reaction. And you should have seen that in the experiment as well. Copper is not a reactive metal, and magnesium is a reactive metal. So the normal state for copper is in its metallic form, and the normal state for magnesium is in its ionic form, and it's going to stay there. Hydrogen is here in sort of brackets. This is where the acid would be. The elements above this should have reacted with acid in activity four, and the elements below it should not have. The elements at the bottom of the list have a special name. They're sometimes called the coinage metals, C-O-I-N-A-G-E. So copper and silver and gold in particular are known as coinage metals. People tend to make money out of these metals, um, copper and silver and gold. They're also known to be valuable. They're valuable in part because they're so unreactive. You wouldn't want to make your metal out of something that reacts. Some of these elements are so reactive, they'll react with just pure water. And most of them will react with an acid solution. So if you spilled a cup of vinegar or a glass of orange juice on your coins, you wouldn't want them to dissolve. The best coins to choose for, for um, the best metals to choose for coins are going to be the ones down at the very bottom. So here's the next question for your viewing quiz. Why isn't mercury a good choice for a coinage metal? Why wouldn't it be a good idea to make coins out of mercury? All right, let's look at the reaction that we just did, but let's write it as an equation instead of looking at the ions in solution. We had a piece of magnesium, which was a solid, and it reacted with copper nitrate, which was in solution. On the product side, we had copper metal, and we had magnesium nitrate. So now the question I'm going to answer is, is this a redox reaction? To determine if this is a redox reaction, we have to look and see if electrons are transferred. And the best way to tell if electrons are transferred are to find the oxidation numbers of all of the elements in the compound. So, to start with, the magnesium is an element all by itself. What will the oxidation number be for an element all by itself? Good, zero. And as long as we're looking for zeros, copper is an element all by itself on the product side. Might as well go ahead and label that with a zero. This is an ionic compound. So the copper has a charge. We know it's charged, not because of what copper is, but because how many nitrates there are. We've got to have those polyatomic ions learned. And we have to know when we look at it that NO3 is called nitrate and that it has a negative one charge. If we need two negatively one, negative one charged nitrates to balance the charge of the copper, then what must the charge of that copper be? Good, plus two. A monatomic ion will always have its charge as its oxidation number. On the other side, we can make the same argument with magnesium, or we could just remember that magnesium does have a common charge. If it's in an ionic compound, its common charge, its, its oxidation number is its common charge. Let's go ahead and figure out what the oxidation numbers are for nitrogen and oxygen in nitrate. That should have been the last question on your viewing quiz for the first lecture, but let's go ahead and go through it together. So nitrate. NO3 with a minus one charge. This is a polyatomic ion. None of the atoms in this polyatomic ion actually have a charge. This is not ionic. This compound or this collection of atoms sticks together because of the covalent bonds, because of the shared electrons. Nobody has a charge here except for this cluster of atoms. But we can still assign oxidation numbers to help keep track of whether reduction or oxidation is happening. Of the two elements, nitrogen and oxygen, which one is more reliable? Oxygen. Oxygen is more reliable. If you go back and look at the list we made in the last video, you'll see oxygen higher on the list. If oxygen is more reliable, it's going to have its common charge as its oxidation number, which means it has a negative 2 
as its oxidation number. So whatever the oxidation number is of nitrogen times one, because there's only one of them, plus three times the oxidation number of the oxygen, which in this case is negative two, has to equal, be careful, when this is a neutral compound, the oxidation numbers have to add up to zero. But this isn't a neutral compound, this is a polyatomic ion. The oxidation numbers then have to add to the charge on the polyatomic ion. So nitrogen, three times negative two is negative six, has to equal negative one. So now to solve this algebraically, we're gonna add six to both sides. And the oxidation number of nitrogen is going to be a positive 5. Okay? Now, the nitrate doesn't change on the product side. So the nitrogen's oxidation number is a plus 5 here and a minus 2 here. It's also a plus 5 on the right and a minus 2 on the left. So neither of those elements change oxidation number. So they're not actually a part of the redox chemistry. There are two elements that change oxidation number. They're the copper and the magnesium. The copper's oxidation number starts out as a plus two on the left-hand side, and then becomes a zero on the right-hand side. As a reactant, it's a plus two. As a product, it's a zero. That means that on the beginning of the reaction, the copper has more protons than it has electrons. It's the only way to get a positive charge. And at the end, it has equal numbers of protons and electrons. The copper can't lose protons. If it loses protons, it becomes another element. If it's still copper, which it is, the protons haven't changed, so the electrons must have increased so that now they balance. That means that the copper gained electrons. If you remember from the last time, hopefully you got a mnemonic or you've just gotten it stuck in your head some way, a substance that gains electrons is reduced. All right, how about the magnesium? Magnesium starts out as a zero, and then goes to a plus two. It starts out with a balanced number of protons and electrons, and then at the end of the reaction, it somehow has more protons than electrons. Can we put extra protons on the magnesium? We cannot, so we must have taken electrons away. The magnesium lost electrons, And the process of losing electrons is better known as being oxidized. Okay, so this is what we learned last time. Based on what we did last time, I hope that you would have been able to fill in sort of this little chart that we have here. But there's a new concept that I want to introduce in this lecture, and that's the idea of an oxidizing agent and a reducing agent. Let's start by thinking about the copper. If we think about this copper ion, who was floating in solution, Let's try to imagine this on the nanoscale, on the molecular level. The copper is floating in solution as an ion in the beginning, and then suddenly at the end, magically, it's a neutral copper atom. Except it's not magic. It's not magic. It's just chemistry. It was reduced, and it gained electrons. But the copper solution was never going to just magically create copper atoms. The only reason the copper could be reduced, the only reason the copper could gain electrons, is because it got them from somewhere. Well, where did it get its electrons from? It got its electrons from the magnesium. The magnesium lost electrons. It gave them to the copper. In order for the copper to be reduced, in order for the copper to gain electrons, something had to give it the electrons. The thing that gave it the electrons was the magnesium. The thing that allowed copper to be reduced was the magnesium. So the magnesium is a reducing agent. All right, we can make the reverse argument for the other element. Magnesium was oxidized. In order to be oxidized, it has to lose electrons. But magnesium can't just drop its electrons on the ground and walk away from them. In order for magnesium to lose electrons, they have to go somewhere. Something has to take them. And the thing that took magnesium's electrons, the thing that allowed magnesium to be oxidized, was the copper. Copper allowed magnesium to be oxidized, and so copper is the oxidizing agent. Oxidation and reduction have to happen in pairs. One thing has to gain electrons, one thing has to lose electrons. The only way a thing can gain electrons is if they're given up by something else. 
The only way something can lose electrons is if they're taken by something else. The two processes are always going to be tied together. Something is oxidized and something is reduced. The thing that's oxidized is the reducing agent, and the thing that's reduced is the oxidizing agent. Make sense? I hope so. If not, let me know. Um, we can do a practice session. You've got some UT Quest problems on this. I also wanted to remind you about that UT Quest assignment. This video is going to be posted on Wednesday. The UT Quest assignment is due Thursday night. It's not a super long assignment, and the one of you who has gotten started on it has done a great job and done a great job pretty quickly. So I'm not totally paranoid or panicked about the fact that the rest of you haven't started it, but it's time, y'all. It's time. Um, you should have finished the activity by this morning, and so today is a good day after you watch this video and take your viewing quiz to make some real progress on that, um, that UT Quest. Tomorrow's goal is the UT Quest, and then to see me if you have questions, and then on Friday we have a quiz. Next week we'll start gases, and I have some things here. We're going to do some activities, and we might even try to do a lab. I haven't decided exactly how that's going to work. Um, so, did I give you a mystery question for today? Um, I don't really have a good mystery question. I gave you two questions from the lecture. I think that's enough. Um, oh, I like this. What would be a fun mystery question for me to ask? Oh, yeah, that's great. You guys can do my work for me. All right. Hope you guys are having a great day. Hope you're staying safe. Um, wash your hands.